Hello everyone, hopefully everybody's assigned and online now. So I'm just going to do a little introduction for Lucy, who's doing our lecture tonight. This is the second webinar series and the lecture for the National Surgical Teaching Society. And um, this evening we have Dr Lucy Scott, who's giving our introduction to general surgery. And um, Lucy is a second year core surgical trainee, currently working at St James's University Hospital in the Leeds in Leeds and she's working in the breast and endocrine unit and um, excitingly she has career aspirations in that field and um, I was lucky enough to work with Lucy in our last job and um, we worked in one of the busiest surgical assessment units in the country and um, she's got a lot of experience recognizing and managing general surgical and neurological presentations and um, not only was she renowned in the department to be absolutely fantastic and one of the best trainees to work with um, but she's also incredibly approachable and um, so keep a note if you have any questions um, and on that note, I will hand you over to Lucy. Thank you. Perfect. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for that introduction, Jen. That's very flattering. Now, I am just going to check that I can share my screen, which looks like I can. Um, so, yeah, so as Jen says, um, I am a core surgical trainee in the Yorkshire and Humber Deanery. I'm currently working in St. James's. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk to you about um, general surgery and introduction. Um, so it's quite a large topic as you can imagine. Um, I have got a, um, if I can make it work, there we go. So this is what I'm going to cover, um, but I just want to say that each actual subject topic is huge and um, it's going to be a very brief um, introduction and um, I'm going to try and target it towards um, what you should know as an FY1 and 2 and um, to make it easier for you to actually carry out the job. Um, so we're going to talk about um, abdominal pain, the types of signs and symptoms you might get, differentials, investigations and management and then abdominal swelling. So I'm going to cover abdominal distension as well as um, hernias. Um, how to examine an abdomen and then common surgical scars that you might come across in a surgical job. So um, when um, someone presents to you with abdominal pain, um, it's quite useful to actually visualise um, and divide the abdomen um, into a consistent method. Um, so you can either use um, the four quadrant method on the left or you can actually split it up further into nine quadrants and having that method in your head just makes it a lot easier to um, visualise the anatomy and actually help you formulate your list of differential diagnoses. Um, so let's start with um, common signs and symptoms. Um, so the majority of times patients actually present to you with abdominal pain. Um, so it's really important that you take a good um, pain history when um, speaking to patients. So um, I use Socrates as a method. Um, it's up to you what you use. Um, just try and be consistent with it. Um, so it means that when you come to formulate your differentials, you've got a good idea of what you think is going on. Um, for example, someone who might present with right upper quadrant pain and actually having um, the difference between, say, a colicky type pain or a constant pain might give you an idea as to whether someone's presenting with biliary colic or whether it's potentially more of a cholecystitis type picture. Um, it's really important to ask people about um, changes in bowel habit, habits as well as vomiting. Um, fever can give you a, a good idea as to whether they've got an infective cause that's causing their symptoms. Um, don't forget other, other systems such as dysuria, um, so that is pain when going for a wee. Um, and then people actually might present um, with signs that they or um, their relatives have noticed, such as jaundice, so the yellowing of the skin or the eyes, um, or they might find lumps and bumps around that um, they that's new and that they want checking out. Um, and then don't forget systemic symptoms as well. So things like indigestion, um, really important to ask about any weight loss or change in appetite um, and early satiety. So that's the feeling of um, being full um, when only eating small amounts. Um, and then don't forget gynae as well. So any PV bleeding or discharge. Okay, so um, what I thought I'd do is break it down into the regions of the abdomen and um, common differentials that you might see um, in your job. 
Um, so I've actually grouped right upper quadrant and epigastric pain together. Um, so because these usually present um, coexistently, so um, biliary colic and cholecystitis, so um, gall strains in the gallbladder or inflammation of the gallbladder. Um, cholangitis, um, so when there is an obstruction in the biliary tree causing infection. Um, pancreatitis, so inflammation of the pancreas, gastritis, inflammation of the stomach, um, and then the more emergency things such as perforated duodenal ulcer. Um, don't forget about malignancies in that area, and sometimes people can actually present with a palpable mass, especially if they've lost quite a lot of weight related to it. Um, and then the slightly more rarer thing of liver abscesses. Um, people can have referred pain from round the back. Um, so don't forget about pyelonephritis in that area. Um, and then AAA, always think about this in generalized abdominal pain and it'll come up on quite a lot of the slides because it is a differential that you do not want to miss. Um, and then the slightly more rarer things, but actually that do present with upper abdominal pain. So constipation, so the transverse colon, as you can see on the diagram, runs along the top. Um, and actually when that stretches, it can cause a bit of abdominal pain for the patient. And then don't forget medical causes. So things like basal pneumonia um, can cause a pleural irritation, PE, um, a, a, a MI in type two diabetics can quite commonly present with epigastric pain. And then things like rib fracture, costochondritis, which is inflammation of the um, costric cartilage and then musculoskeletal pain. Okay, so um, left upper quadrant, um, it's actually, uh, there isn't really much that we get involved with in this area. Um, the biggest thing to rule out is, um, especially if someone's had trauma, is actually a splenic bleed. Oh, here we go. So I've noticed there's a couple of questions that have come up. Let me see if I can see these. So the first one we had was, what recommendations do you have for a final year doing a general surgery student ass assistantship for making the most of their placement? Right, okay, um, that's probably a question that I can cover at the end actually when I've gone through the talk um, because what I can do is I can quickly go through um, both having done an F1 job as a, uh, in a colorectal unit and also having been an SHO and um, what stood out for me as a good F1 trainee so if I can delay that one to the end that would be useful and um, so if you wouldn't mind reminding me of that one at the end. Sure. And this, the second was also one you can answer at the end as well. So I'll ask them. I'll ask them then. Perfect. So where were we? So um, left upper quadrant pain. Um, so the most important thing for us as general surgeons is a splenic bleed. And this usually happens after trauma. Um, so have a um, high index of suspicion if um, someone has um, abdominal pain, especially in that region, if they've had a high impact injury. Um, again, constipation for um, the um, same reason I said before of the stretching of the bowel in that area. And again, referred pain from pyelonephritis, pneumonia, PE, costochondritis, and MSK. Okay, so um, umbilical region. Um, so this is a bit more vague, really, in terms of presenting um, features. Um, if you have a small bowel obstruction, um, then people sometimes complain of um, pain in the umbilical region um, because this is where um, the majority of the small bowel is. Um, also ischemic bowel, this can actually present in any, um, any of the quadrants of the abdomen, um, but again, very dependent on where the, um, the blood obstruction is. But if it's small bowel, then it will have um, umbilical um, pain. Um, Early appendicitis, so um, the classic textbook of appendicitis that, is that people um, have um, umbilical pain, which then refers to the um, right iliac fossa. Um, pancreatitis, if the pancreas is quite inflamed, it can actually have pain in the whole of the upper abdomen. Um, and again, as I mentioned, AAA, um, just suspect it in anyone who's a um, vascular path. Um, and an umbilical hernia. Um, so if hernias in, in the umbilicus are big enough, then bowel can actually um, get stuck, um, but it is quite pronounced on examination, so it's something you won't, you won't miss. Um, so flank pain, um, so this is sort of your more um, your renal area, so pyelonephritis, um, ureteric 
colic. So as the, um, the renal stone drops out of the kidney into the pipe, that's when most people tend to get the pain because it floats around quite freely in the kidney. But then as it drops into the ureter, um, it's squeezing down a narrow pipe and people get that typical colically type pain. Um, and again, AAA and MSK. Okay, so right elect fossa, so the bread and butter of general surgeons. So you will get referred people with right elect fossa pain all the time. And the main differential that you want to rule out is appendicitis. Um, and we'll come on to um, investigations and management of this later. Um, so diverticulitis, so diverticulitis can happen in um, any part of the large bowel. Um, it is more common um, in the sigmoid bowel, so you would get pain in the left iliac fossa, um, but actually um, it can happen anywhere in the bowel and if people have had diverticulitis for a long time it can actually present with right iliac fossa pain. Um, Crohn's disease, um, so the most common presenting complaint of Crohn's disease um, is at the ileocecal junction, which is in the right iliac fossa. So be aware of this, especially if you have young males or females presenting with right iliac fossa pain and um, changes in bowel habits, um, particularly diarrhea. Um, large bowel obstruction, so um, the cecum is the baggiest part of the large bowel, um, so as this stretches um, people can actually present with pain in the right iliac fossa even though the whole bowel is distended um, and I'll come on to this a little bit later on. Um, don't forget your gynae system, so um, sudden onset, lower abdominal pain in young females, um, especially with normal blood tests, can very much be a ovarian torsion, which is a gynae emergency, so um, have a low index of suspicion for that. Um, cyst ruptures um, and also um, ectopic pregnancies, um, so don't forget to do a pregnancy test for every young female, well all females of reproductive age that come into the unit. Um, pelvic inflammatory disease, um, inguinal hernias, which we'll go into a little bit later on, and always, always examine testicles in males who present with lower abdominal pain. It's inexcusable to miss a testicular problem. Um, just because you don't want to do it doesn't mean you can't do it. Okay, perfect. So left iliac fossa, so as I mentioned before, diverticulitis, and it's definitely more common um, in the sigmoid bowel, which is on that side. Um, colitis, and this can actually um, present anywhere, but it is more common on the left side. Um, so ischemic causes of this, um, inflammatory, such as Crohn's and UC, and also infective. So anyone who you suspect might have colitis, get them to do a stool sample for you and send it off. So um, you can rule out a infective cause. Um, large bowel obstruction, and again, all the things we talked about for the right groin, um, so your gynae systems and your testicular pain. And last but not least, um, the suprapubic region. Um, so urinary retention, um, especially in old males who may have a um, enlarged prostate and have gradually um, been peeing out less and less and the blood has been stretching. Um, if it's causing them pain, you actually might be able to feel a bladder when you examine people. Um, urinary tract infection and also your ST STIs. And um, be wary that sometimes um, diverticulitis um, can um, present with suprapubic pain because as the sigmoid colon comes round, it can actually end up being quite central for people. Um, and also appendicitis. Um, so you can have um, a um, appendix that actually lies behind the bladder um, and ends up presenting with suprapubic pain. Okay, so um, investigations now. Um, I tend to um, split up um, this into bedsides, bloods and imaging um, because it's quite a nice little system to have for an OSCE exam, um, but also helps me to um, remember what I need to do for patients. Um, so for investigations, we're going to talk specifically about appendicitis, pancreatitis, cholecystitis, diverticular disease, and a triple A. Um, so for all these patients, what you can do at the bedside is obviously your A to E assessment if you are worried this patient is quite unwell, um, or if you've been asked to see a patient who um, has a diagnosis of this on the ward um, and the nursing staff are concerned. Um, so get your A to E assessment down um, 
observations so um especially for things like appendicitis we um if we don't want to take them to theatre straight away we actually um have a um we watch the new score because a trend in new score can suggest the appendix is becoming more inflamed and we might need to think about taking people to theatre earlier um, ECG, so if any of these patients are quite sick, then um, they might be tachycardic and it's always useful just to rule out that it's actually coming from a systemic cause such as sepsis rather than actually having a primary cardiac event. Um, rectal examination, so this is particularly useful in people with diverticular disease. Um, you need to figure out whether they've got a full or empty rectum and if anyone is bleeding from the back passage it's useful to rule out that there isn't anything um, such as hemorrhoids which might be bleeding rather than something which is further inside. Um, as I said before urine dip and pregnancy test um, always just helps rule out the obvious such as a ectopic pregnancy or potentially just a UTI which is causing their abdominal pain. Um, and catheters, um, especially for people um, with pancreatitis, um, because it's really important that we monitor their input output. Okay, so bloods. Um, now, pretty standard full blood count, looking for markers of infection, using these, um, keeping an idea on hydration, um, CRP, um, markers of inflammation. Um, LFTs and amylase um, for right upper quadrant pain and pancreatitis um, and if you have a slightly elevated amylase but you're not convinced it's pancreas um, you can actually do a lipase which is a lot more specific for pancreatitis um, and just to know a slightly raised amylase with epigastric pain can be gastritis because the amylase can go up slightly in gastritis so if you're not sure just add on a lipase and if the lipase is high you happy that that's a pancreatitis diagnosis. Um, calcium and LDH, um, so this is part of your pancreatitis scoring which helps you to determine how um, severe a pancreatitis is and I'll come on to this a little bit later on. Um, blood cultures if um, your patient is septic, um, an ABG or a VBG, so if you're doing pancreatitis scoring it's useful to do an ABG because part of that scoring is actually the PO2, um, whereas if you're just looking at a appendicitis or a cholecystitis and you're looking at the lactate then a VBG is okay. Um, and if you think any of these patients might need to go to theatre it's worth doing the group and save and of course you will be doing a cross match if it's a AAA and you're worried it's leaking. So I'm quickly going to go through some images um, because I think it's quite useful actually to have a look what these things look like on the various imaging modalities. Um, as you go through your training, it's worth having a good look through images um, because as you get more senior and you are waiting for the report of a scan, it's useful for you to have an idea in your head what you think might be going on. And then when the report comes, you've potentially planned, for example, if you think it's a perforation and you need to tee that person up to go to theatre. So um, on the left image on your screen um, is what a ovarian cyst looks like. Um, the middle image is what appendicitis looks like on an ultrasound. So you can see the arrows are pointing to a thick walled appendix. Um, now, usually um, we do ultrasounds for young females because of the radiation risk rather than a CT. Um, but it's actually usually to rule out any ovarian pathology. It's actually quite rare that they can get a good view of the appendix on an ultrasound. Um, and then the uh, image on the right is what a gallstone in the gallbladder looks like. Um, and this is an ultrasound of a aortic aneurysm. So on the left is a normal view of the aorta. And then on the right, you can see the aneurysm um, there on the, in the wall. Okay. So moving on to CT, um, so um, on the left, um, so CT can be used for all of these um, diagnoses, but on the left you can see right in the middle of the image the um, 
lighter, slightly um, edematous structure um, is the pancreas. Um, so on the left, you've got the liver and just slightly above that, the circular structure is the gallbladder. And then if you come across from that, you can see the pancreas in the middle. Um, and at the bottom on the left and the right are the, just the upper poles of the two kidneys that come into view. Um, the middle image um, is a very large um, gallbladder um, and it's actually got the arrows pointing to the gallstones there in the gallbladder. Um, and then the right image is a, um, again, the what a enlarged thick walled gallbladder looks like on CT. Um, and that's the sagittal view. Um, and CT on the left there um, in the box is what appendicitis looks like. Um, so you can see the um, tubular structure there that has a um, thick wall, which is the lighter edge, and that's appendicitis. Um, and then the image on the right is um, quite extensive diverticular disease. So where the arrows are pointing to, um, there are all the little outpouchings of the um, diverticular disease on the sigmoid colon and the ones that are slightly lighter um, sh are showing diverticulitis because they're inflamed. And then last but not least is a whopping big uh, aneurysm, aortic aneurysm. Um, so you can see that's a angiogram so you can see the lighter area of that is um, that the contrast is going through and then the darker area is the, um, the wall with the aneurysm in it. And um, when you are concerned um, that a gallstone may have gone into the bile duct, um, you need to do an MRCP, so that's a, um, an MRI scan, um, and this is what this is showing. So on the left, it's um, the, um, all the uh, vasculature in the liver, um, and the large structure at the bottom is the gallbladder. Um, and then the image on the right, um, where the arrows are pointing to, so particularly A and B, um, are gallstones in both the gallbladder and the common bile duct. Um, this is what well, I mean, it's a computer generated image, but this is what diverticular disease looks like on a flexible sigmoidoscopy. So you can see the little out pouchings, and um, that's the kind of thing people can see when they do the flexi sigs. Okay, so that's the investigations covered. Um, we're now going to move on to management of these five conditions. Um, so appendicitis, so what we would expect from a, either an F1 if you'd call out the patient or as you guys move on to SHO grade, um, important to give these people analgesia because um, appendicitis really does hurt. Um, antibiotics, now this is a bit of a, um, a controversial topic. If your patient is septic, then absolutely go for IV antibiotics. Um, but sometimes consultants um, actually won't give um, patients antibiotics, especially if their observations are normal and their bloods are reasonably normal. Um, this is because if you're going to um, adopt the watch and wait um, for appendicitis, so essentially you admit the patient and observe them, um, then it's better to leave them off antibiotics because as the appendix gets more inflamed, um, the patient will become more unwell, whereas antibiotics can actually sometimes mask that. So it's easier to know what you're dealing with without the antibiotics. But again, that's something to ask the consultant because that is very consultant dependent. Um, IV fluids, so you're gonna be keeping these patients null by mouth. So it's important to keep them hydrated. Um, and as I mentioned before, a group and save for these patients. Um, so we'll always group and save an appendicitis, even if they're young, because um, they can bleed and it's useful to have one in the system. Um, so I've put book and consent in um, italics because it's probably going to be your senior that does this. Um, but I would uh, um, advise you to watch how they book people and watch how they consent people because if you have got an interest in surgery as a career, it's useful to observe this from, um, from the start and then you know what kind of things, um, risks and benefits are discussed with the patient. Um, and communicate with the patient. Um, if you think someone's got appendicitis, you know, tell them that. It's... You, it's, it's okay to be wrong, um, but the patients really appreciate the communication um, and 
to know what the next steps are. Okay, pancreatitis. Um, so, um, again, similar, pancreatitis really does hurt. So get some good analgesia into the patient. They probably might even be um, requiring morphine. Um, so things like Oromorph is useful to give to the patient. Um, IV fluids, so pancreatitis can cause a lot of third space losses. Um, so make sure um, the patient is nice and hydrated. Um, and again, that goes with input output monitoring. So um, ask the nurses to keep a good eye on how much um, you're putting into the patient and how much the patient is peeing out because they can become dehydrated really quite quickly. Um, it's useful to try and get pancreatitis to um, patients to eat um, as early as possible and um, this is because um, the if you go without um, food in the stomach for a prolonged period of time then it can actually cause changes in the pH which can actually cause translocation of bacteria which with the stomach lying so close to the pancreas it can cause quite a lot of inflammation in that area and can be, cause the patient to become really quite sick and that's when you get things like necrotic pancreatitis, necrotizing pancreatitis, sorry. Um, so if they feel up to it and they can, then um, tell them to um, eat little and often. Um, and then pancreatitis scoring, um, which is important for um, where you're going to end up looking after this patient. So if this patient is scoring a three or more in the pancreatitis scoring, um, they may need ICU input. Um, so this is the pancreatitis score. Um, so as you can see, it's a range of um, markers which um, all score a point and um, you add them up. And if it's a three or more, then that's um, significant, uh, severe pancreatitis, which um, you're going to want to get ICU involved for that. Um, so PAO2, so that's where you need your ABG to see how well they um, are oxygenating themselves. Um, and this is because pancreatitis can cause um, ARDS, so you want to keep an eye on how well they're breathing. Um, age, so anyone over 55 automatically scores a 1. Neutrophils, um, so if there's um, evidence of infection there, then that um, bumps up your score. Um, calcium, renal function, enzymes, so you'll need to add on LDH as a separate um, blood test. Um, albumin, which comes as part of your LFTs, and um, glucose, which you can get off your ABG. Okay, so moving on to cholecystitis. Um, so again, analgesia, um, IV fluids, um, IV antibiotics, um, and this does vary from um, hospital to hospital even. Um, so it may be comoxiclav, um, it may be uh, kefuroxime, it very much depends on where you're working, so consult your local guidelines for that. Um, again, these patients can eat and drink, um, and the ultimate management for them will be a cholecystectomy. Um, now, some centres will do something called a hot laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which essentially is um, they will take the patient to theatre within seven days of the onset of their pain if the patient is still within that window. Um, or they will decide to do a delayed cholecystectomy, which is um, after six weeks of, uh, from their initial presentation. And they usually send them home with a prolonged course of oral antibiotics to try and get the inflammation under control before they decide to do the elective cholecystectomy for that patient. But again, um, it will be um, your senior who will decide what to do um, about the gallbladder at that point. Okay, diverticular disease. Um, so diverticular disease covers a range of um, presentations. So within itself, all it means is there are diverticular present in the bowel. Um, diverticulitis means that the diverticular are inflamed and you can have diverticular bleeds. Um, so analgesia if they've got lower abdominal pain and um, fluids although these patients can eat and drink so if they're drinking enough orally then you don't have to put them on IV fluids um, IV antibiotics and again this is a bit of a controversial topic um, so mild diverticulitis there were actually new guidelines that came out to suggest that they didn't need antibiotics um, but if there's any evidence of um, 
complicated diverticulitis such as um, a diverticular abscess or a small um, localised perforation, then these patients do get um, antibiotics. Um, keep an eye on their stool and again send some off for culture if you think it might actually be more of an inflammatory, um, sorry, infective cause. Um, laxatives and enemas, so um, diverticulitis um, can be caused by constipation, so as the stool um, sits next to the diverticular for uh, a couple of days it can actually block the diverticular and that's when it becomes stagnant and becomes inflamed so if people have said that they haven't opened their bowels for a couple of days um, then giving patients enemas or laxatives can actually help um, and the kind of counseling that you're going to be wanting to do for these patients um, encourage them to eat high fibre diets um, so this just helps to soften um, the stool and actually add bulk, which means that they pass the stool a bit easier um, and make sure that they drink lots of water again to soften the stool to try and prevent this from happening again. Um, if someone is presented with a diverticular bleed, um, there's actually not a lot that you can do for them as an inpatient, apart from obviously monitoring the bleeding. Um, if you wanted to do a scope for these patients, you wouldn't be able to see anything. Um, so it's always a case of these patients get outpatient um, flexible sigmoidoscopy. Um, and if the patient itch actually isn't known to have um, diverticular disease, then this is the gold standard for diagnosis of diverticular disease. Okay, so AAA. Um, so this is going to be um, guided towards the fact that you think a AAA might be leaking. Um, so these patients are going to get obviously going to get sick really quite quickly and um, so if you can move them to um, a HDU or a um, have a cardiac monitor on these patients to keep an eye on um, their heart rate and their blood pressure continuously um, then that's really useful and um, what you guys can do as um, doctors who have been called to see the patient initially is try and get a, a large cannula into them so either a gray or an orange and um, because you need um, the the access and to be able to push fluid and blood through them quite quickly if that's what it comes to um, analgesia for the patient um, group and save cross match and ultimately blood transfusion and if they are bleeding very quickly you can activate the um, uh, Oh, I've forgotten what it's called. Uh, major transfusion protocol. There you go. Apologies. Um, these patients obviously need immediate vascular discussion um, to um, decide what operative management they need. So get your senior involved really quite quickly. If you've got a vascular team in your hospital, you can fast fleet them to get them there as soon as possible. Or if you don't, get the general surgical registrar involved um, because they're going to be able to help you um, liaise with the uh, vascular team in another hospital. Um, and as an F1, it's quite useful if you're not sort of um, in the midst of it, trying to resuscitate the patient, is actually have a quick look through their notes if you don't know the patient very well. You know, what other comorbidities do they have? What kind of quality of life do they have? Because actually bringing those things to the attention of the seniors might actually um, lead towards um, maybe it's not a good idea for this patient to have surgery. Maybe it's one of those patients that we need to keep comfortable um, and to have a um, DNA CPR discussion with. Okay, so that is abdominal pain covered. <laughs> um, so as you can see, it's a very broad topic and that by any means was not um, an all encompassing talk. And um, it's worth just doing a lot of reading around those topics, but they are common. So you will get used to them as you, as you do the job. Um, so I'm now going to move on to abdominal swelling um, and I've grouped this into generalised abdominal swelling and also localised. Um, I am going to talk more about um, bowel obstruction um, and hernias um, because they are more common for um, what uh, we see as general surgeons, um, but I will briefly touch on the others. Um, so the image on the the right, the top right, is of a sigmoid volvula. So that is your classic coffee bean sign, um, which they like to throw up in Fithieroskis, um, in if you have a slideshow um, examination, which is what we had at Leeds. Um, 
and in the bottom the picture is of all the different types of hernias that you can get in the abdomen um, so don't just think it's immediately an inguinal hernia which is the the more common um, it can actually be hernias um, elsewhere so make sure you really um, qualify where the, the, the lump is um, okay, so the four criteria uh, for bowel obstruction for your diagnosis is um, absolute constipation, which means they've not passed any stool or flatus at all. Um, abdominal distension, they've got pain with it and they are vomiting. So small bowel obstruction. Um, so that's usually um, in the central abdomen, which is where they um, can complain of pain but as the bowel stretches it can be anywhere in particular um, because the small bowel is obstructed um, they tend to start vomiting quite quickly and um, because it's quite a proximal obstruction and um, so that's quite a prominent feature in the history when you're taking it um, the most common causes of small bowel obstruction um, are adhesional. Um, so this can actually be congenital bands. So people are born with um, slightly thicker adhesions, um, which can lead to bowel obstruction as they get older, um, or secondary to previous surgery. Um, and they, uh, as the scar tissue forms um, after the operation, um, it can actually cause adhesional um, bowel obstruction. Um, hernias, um, as I said, it, not just necessarily inguinal hernias, can be femoral hernias and can also be umbilical hernias, I've um, seen all of them. Um, and Crohn's disease, so um, because Crohn's disease is an inflammatory process, um, you end up getting stricturing of the bowel, which is where you can then pro progress to small bowel obstruction, so that's the um, pathophysiology behind that. Um, so you can see from the picture um, that is small bowel and you're happy that it's small bowel because you can see the lines um, extend all the way across from one wall to the other, one bowel wall to the other. And these are called valvuli coniventes. So that's the um, diagnostic um, measure for small bowel obstruction. Um, okay, so large bowel obstruction. Um, so this image is not the best really i couldn't really find a better one um but it's more of a peripheral um picture so this image is um showing that the transverse colon so the one that runs along the top um is quite dilated but because it's so dilated it's actually looped itself down um into the lower abdomen so that's why it looks like that um, so the most common causes of large bowel obstruction um, are a volvula, so a twisting of the bowel, and um, cancers, so particularly rectal cancers and sigmoid cancers, and um, strictures again from um, inflammatory bowel disease um, or if the cancer has caused the stricture. Um, and sometimes if people have um, ischemic colitis, that can actually cause stricturing as well. Um, hernias again and also um, faecal impaction so a large um, bit of poo in the rectum um, which stops everything from going past and causes upstream dilatation of the bowel. Um, so the difference here on the x-ray is um, the lines don't go all the way across and it's as simple as that um, and these are haustra of a large bowel um, so you know that that's a large bowel obstruction on your x-ray. Okay, um, so bowel obstruction, how do we investigate it? Um, so what you guys can do um, is a baseline set of bloods because one of the differentials for um, a obstruction is an ileus, um, which is essentially um, slowing of the peristalsis of the bowel. Um, and that can be caused by electrolyte derangements such as potassium. And so good idea just to check your routine um, using these as well as calcium, magnesium and phosphate um, and a lactate. So um, this bowel obviously will not stretch to um, infinity. So as it gets towards its critical point, your lactate starts to ramp up. Um, so if you've got a patient with bowel obstruction on the x-ray and a high lactate, you need to escalate that straight away because that suggests imminent perforation 
um, your abdominal x-ray, um, as we've seen, um, and ultimately um, a CT scan will help you determine actually what's caused the bowel obstruction um, and will help for um, planning uh, operative management. Um, so management for these patients are Ryle's tube, um, which is a nasogastric tube, which you insert um, in the nostril and goes down into the stomach. Um, it's quite a large bore, um, and what you can use is a 60 mil bladder syringe and actually just pull off all of the abdominal contents to try and shrink the bowel slightly to buy you a little bit more time. Um, and if you're going to treat this patient conservatively, then that is the management for them. Um, as well as IV fluids to keep them hydrated um, and it's useful to keep an eye on how much is coming out of the Riles tube um, so you can try and add this on to your IV maintenance fluids um, so the patient isn't losing um, a lot um, that you're not putting in. Um, correct electrolytes as I said so if a patient's got um, a high, um, sorry a low um, potassium for example you can give them supplements um, if a patient has a volvulus um, or has a faecal impaction as the cause of their obstruction, you can use a flatus tube or enemas. Um, and most of these patients um, will proceed to surgery um, because it's usually either a cancer um, or a hernia that's um, blocking their bowel. Right, so... Um, these are, these are the complications of bowel obstructions and the things that you need to worry um, and watch out for because we see loads of people in bowel obstruction that manage quite happily. Um, so the 369 rule, um, so this is a sort of a rough idea. Um, so you know how dilated the bowel is before you need to start worrying. Um, so a dilated small bowel um, is three centimeters, so that's the three. Um, a large bowel dilation is six centimeters and a um, dilated cecum is nine centimeters um, because the cecum is the baggiest bit of the bowel, so that's got a little bit more um, stretch to play with as such. Um, so as a bowel stretches, um, then you start you start to lose blood supply to the wall so the image um in the top left um on the lowest on the left side you can see a very large cecum that's what that is and if you look on the edge of the bowel um you can see loads of tiny black dots um and that's actually air in the bowel wall and that's something called pneumatosis coli um and that suggests imminent bowel perforation so that is an emergency that you need to escalate straight away if you see that on the CT images. Um, a closed loop bowel obstruction um, can again is an, is an emergency um, and this can either be from a um, twisting in the bowel so that particular part of bowel has completely closed itself off from blood supply and is going to die imminently unless um, we do something about it, which usually means an operation. Um, and there's also um, this com um, competent or incompetent ileocecal valve. Um, don't worry about that too much, but essentially what that is, is um, the valve between the ileum, so the terminal ileum, so the end bit of the small bowel that goes into the cecum, which is the start of the large bowel, should only be a one-way valve. So if um, so essentially poo should only flow from the ileum to the cecum. Um, if somebody has a incompetent valve, it means it actually flows in reverse, which actually can save a lot of people um, because if they've got large bowel obstruction and that starts to fill up and then you've got a competent valve, so a blockage, then the cecum starts to blow and that's you're more likely to get a perforation from that. Whereas if you've got an incompetent valve, so you can get that backflow, then actually that can save quite a lot of people um, from having a bowel perforation. But that's a slightly more complicated um, theory, so don't worry about that too much. Um, the top right image shows um, air under the diaphragm, so you'd be worried about a... Um, a bowel perforation, well, any, any viscous perforation in the abdomen, but um, if you had the history of bowel obstruction and then you saw that, you would be worried about that. Okay, so 
um, growing lumps nice and quickly. Um, so differentials for your lumps in the groin. Um, so inguinal hernias. So this is a, um, a hernia in the um, inguinal region. Um, and the image to the right um, shows the difference between direct and indirect hernias. Um, so an indirect hernia follows the path of the inguinal canal. So that's the image that's um, surrounded in blue. And a direct hernia actually pushes itself through the abdominal wall and the posterior aspect of the inguinal canal. And that's the image in purple. Um, a femoral hernia, um, which um, is in the femoral um, space um, where the vessels pass through from the abdomen into the thigh. Um, abscesses um, and um, these are fairly common in um, intravenous drug users who inject in the groin. Um, aneurysms or pseudoaneurysms, um, a saphena varix, which is um, the bottom diagram. So it's where the femoral vein joins the long saphenous vein. You actually get a small aneurysm and that can appear as a lump. And because it's in the groin, um, people um, think, well, mistake that for, um, for hernias. Um, and also lymph nodes. Um, and the way that you're going to um, determine what it is, is either by ultrasound scans or by CT scans. Um, so last but not least, um, don't worry guys, we're coming to the end now. <laughs> um, so abdominal scars. Um, so this image was just readily found on Google and it's useful um, to um, quickly revise um, especially the night before an exam, um, because you um, will find um, patients, especially in your fifth year, that do have these scars. Um, and it's a nice couple of points on um, the OSCE mark scheme for you. Um, so um, the red line at the top is a rooftop incision, um, and that's good access to um, the upper abdomen. So things like a gastrectomy or any um, liver surgery, such as lobectomies. Um, the black line and um, very similar to that but extends up a little bit towards the thoracic cavity um, is more for liver transplant or any diaphragm surgery um, the green incision um, is if you wanted to do a open cholecystectomy um, but the majority of those time laparoscopically um, the maroon incision around the side um, is if you were going to do an ephrectomy um, your um, orange incision um, is the, um, the old school open appendicectomy um, and also um, slightly um, same area but a slightly different angle is your gridiron incision both for appendicectomies. Um, your blue line straight down the middle is your laparotomy um, and this can extend from the um, pubic symphysis all the way up to the ziphy sternum um, depending on what you need it for. Um, the olive incision is paramedian and this isn't done very often really at all because this incision actually goes through um, the rectus muscle um, whereas the blue incision goes um, through the fascia um, down the middle called the linear alba so it's um, a lot less um, um, problems for the patient in the future um, and then the grey incision right down at the bottom is for any gynae surgery and um, cesarean section. Okay, so quick summary. Um, I would say the most important thing in surgery is please, please, please do not be afraid to ask. Um, no question is a silly question. Um, and at the end of the day, you're asking um, for your own learning or because you want to do the right things for your patients. So either way, um, please don't be afraid to ask. Um, use the team around you um, so don't be afraid to approach seniors um, whether it's your SHO whether it's your reg or even with your consultant and um, when I did my F1 job I worked very closely with the consultant and any question I had I would just go straight to them and um, they know the patient and they're responsible for the patient at the end of the day so they want to know um, and things like um, senior sisters on the wards you know they they have probably been managing surgical patients for you know 20 years plus and so they will have a lot of experience so if you have questions and um, ask them 
Um, it's really important to communicate any things like CT scan results, um, histology that you might get um, straight away, um, because um, usually um, patients who are having CT scans during the day um, will need um, management plans based on that. So it's useful to try and get them communicated as soon as possible whilst your consultant's still in the hospital and um, makes it easier for both of you. Um, learn to prioritise jobs now. This is this is quite difficult really as an F1 um, for a surgical job because you will do a ward round um, and it may be sort of 20, 30, 40 patients um, and you will have jobs for all those patients. Um, it's something you will get used to, um, but in your first couple of shifts, if you're struggling, um, maybe ask one of the SHOs um, who have just done your job to say, look, you know, what do I need to do first? What do you think are most important? Um, and then you just get used to the kind of things you need to do, um, such as requesting scans, chasing scans, things like that. Um, always use your A to E when you're assessing sick patients. It's just um, a framework that everybody's used to um, and is um, will allow you not to miss anything. Um, and most importantly, surgery is fun. I'm having a great time um, and I would not want to change my career pathway. Um, so it is fun. It just sometimes is quite stressful, but um, you do get the rewards with it as well. Perfect. So um, I will now take your questions. So thank you for waiting so patiently because obviously I can't really manage technology very well and probably would have lost the PowerPoint again. Um, if you could all scan the QR reader, um, the QR code, and it takes you to a feedback form, um, it will only take you a couple of minutes and I would very much appreciate the feedback. Um, that would be perfect. Um, so if someone could read out the questions for me again, that would be useful and then I can just leave the screen as it is. Um, either Will or Jen. So going back to the question we asked before, yes. um, what recommendations do you have for a final year student doing a general surgery assistantship for making the most of their placement? Okay, perfect. So um, I would say it's probably worth you trying to shadow um, not just the FY1, but maybe the registrar and the SHO. Um, so where I've worked in particular, the FY1s um, would usually look after the ward patients and will have done the ward round with the consultants. Um, so that's obviously very useful to do to um, get used to how they prioritise jobs, um, how they write in notes on ward rounds, um, the communication that they have with the the staff on the wards and also the consultants um, and then it's usually the um, SHOs in some places it is F1s but it's usually the SHOs who clerk in the patients when they're on call and um, so that's actually quite useful to shadow them as well and to get experience of um, clerking patients because you can um, present your patients to either the SHO or the registrar and they can give you immediate feedback on um, things you might have missed things you've done well and um, so I would probably say try and shadow all the different members of staff just to get you a good broad um, introduction to the unit and how it works. Okay the second question was um, how you personally Lucy found course surgical training as a female? Ah interesting um, so I've, I think I've been very lucky um, so I did my first year in Pinderfields which is in Wakefield um, and it's technically a DDH, but actually it's the third busiest A&E in the country. So you can imagine a lot of stuff comes towards the, um, the way of the general surgeons to try and shift people out of A&E. Um, but actually, um, I've not had, um, I presume this question is probably towards prejudice of females, but I've actually not had any bad experiences in that. I've been very, very lucky. Um, I've had the same experiences that my male colleagues have had, I've had the same exposure um, and actually I think sometimes you um, can actually have, uh, consultants can actually have a bit of a soft spot for you because you are a female and because they're trying to get more females into the field and um, so I've not had any bad experiences with it at all um, and I probably am very lucky but um, I haven't heard any horror stories, which again, I think is um, shows that the surgical field itself is changing. Could you explain the difference between colitis and Crohn's? 
Yes, of course I can. Um, so colitis um, is um, just a general term for inflammation of the bowel, um, whereas Crohn's is a specific type of um, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so you can have Crohn's, which causes colitis, but it's not the only cause of colitis. Um, there are other causes such as um, ischemic colitis, so lack of blood supply um, or infective colitis, so things like food poisoning, which causes inflammation of the bowel. Is that a bit clearer? Thank you. Uh, one of our attendees has acknowledged um, a need to improve working knowledge of anatomy um, and has asked whether you think that organising a placement in general surgery will be a useful supplement. Um, interesting. I think. In addition to or, or alongside a, a standard dissection room placement? Yes. Um, I think it depends. So having um, exposure to things like prosections um, and anatomy videos are very useful. Um, I'm actually currently studying for my part B of the um, MR um, exams and um, it's a combination of everything really. I think it's useful to have the background knowledge. Um, so I used even the medical school textbooks of things like Grey's Anatomy, Atlas for Anatomy. Um, I also have the flashcards for Grey's Anatomy, um, which is quite useful if you want to just quickly test yourself. Um, and then things like learning with pro sections is very useful um, and does feature quite a lot in surgical exams um, if surgery is a career that you want to go forward for. But um, I'd say probably the best way is actually um, getting exposure in theatre and um, so you can read all the textbooks that you want but actually um, seeing what a gallbladder looks like, seeing what a liver looks like, seeing what bowel looks like, um, there's kind of no, um, no difference really to first hand exposure so if you have the opportunity to have um, to go into theatre with the general surgeons or any surgeons really um, to actually see the anatomy even if you aren't scrubbed into the procedure and even if you're just looking over the shoulder of the surgeon it is useful. So when examining patients like done in the video how important is exposure? Um, so a lot of the videos and explanations often show um, full exposure of the patient. However, in practice, um, people have asked that it's rarely, rarely seen that doctors do this. What would be your advice? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, it's quite funny watching that video back because I can't remember the last time that I did all of those um, parts of the examination for a patient. Um, I think it's one of those things that comes with practice. So um, if you've taken the history for the patient, you probably have a fairly good idea of what's going on. And um, so you probably need to know the way you're going to focus your examination for sure. Um, but like I said before, if you're examining the abdomen, you definitely want um, the top exposed, um, at least to the bottom of the rib cage, um, removal of top completely if the patient's happy with that and um, you want to be able to um, see um, both their hip bones um, and that's your full um, abdominal um, examination um, and as I said before if it's a male and it's lower abdominal pain you need to be able to examine the testicles and the groin but if you have, I always have a chaperone with me just because it, it makes it easier for examining. Um, and if you just to explain to the patient as you go on, you know, now I need to examine this part of you. Now I need to examine this part of you. And if you can try and cover up the part you're not examining at the time, it makes the patients feel more comfortable and it makes you feel more comfortable. But it's something that does come with practice. Could you tell us a bit more about what you did during medical school and during your foundation years to boost your course surgical training portfolio? Yeah, of course I can. Um, so I had a colorectal job as an F1 um, in Pinderfields again. Um, and then um, I had a plastic surgery job in um, F2. Um, and that was in um, the Leeds General Infirmary, um, which is a very, very good centre um, if anyone is interested in plastics. Um, because they also have the children's, uh, it's a children's hospital as well. So you also have the full range of ages for plastic surgery. Um, so they were the two jobs that I had. Um, i trying to think what I had back in medical school. Um, my third year placement was in, um, was actually in breast surgery um, in Airedale, um, which was probably really the, the starting fact of me thinking I wanted a career in breast surgery. 
Um, there was a um, society called Cutting Edge, um, which is a surgical society, um, and they ran um, quite a lot of conferences through the year, really, um, which I tried to go to. Um, and they also ran um, things like suturing courses. Um, so that was quite useful um, to be able to get a certificate to say that you've been to a suturing course, things like that. Um, I managed to um, get a prize in a, a competition, which was a, um, a medical school um, surgical competition, which helped boost my portfolio completely by fluke, <laughs> not by skill. Um, so that was quite useful. Um, and I made sure I could go on things like taster days um, to show that um, I had an interest in the career and that I wanted to, um, to broaden my knowledge. Um, but what I would say, if you're interested in surgery, um, it's the um, application um, form for core surgical training is on the internet. Um, so you can download it and it will show you what marks you get for each section. So um, you can start working towards ticking those boxes. Um, but actually what I found quite useful is um, not everything that you put in your portfolio had to be directed towards surgery. Um, you could actually, you know, I, I had a, a, a audit and a poster presentation for um, for geriatrics and that still got me points because it was transferable skills and um, so don't be afraid to pursue something in a slightly different area if it's not your chosen field because there are that you will still get points for it on a similar topic um what portion of the core surgical training portfolio checklist did you find the most difficult to achieve um, Oh, so at research, I didn't have any publications um, when I applied, um, but that didn't hinder me at all. Um, I got my first choice job uh, for core surgical training. So, um, and I definitely didn't have the um, the top portfolio by any means. Um, it's not just a portfolio ex um, interview. Don't forget that. So there are the two other stations. Um, so um, if you prepare well for those, thinking that you've not got the strongest portfolio, it still doesn't hinder you um, from um, from doing well overall. But yeah, I mean, I didn't have any um, any publications when I applied, and I still still did what I wanted to do. So yeah, it's definitely the hardest section. <laughs> okay, the last question we've got is. Um, if you were given a choice, where would you try to get your surgical job during your foundation years? Would F1 or F2 be, be, be more valuable, do you think? Oh, that is a good question. Um, so I was very lucky in that I actually got a surgical job for both years. Um, and But I know that that is quite few and far between. Um, they're, they're very different experiences. So um, as an F1, it's a lot more ward based and you do the ward rounds and when you're on call you tend to be covering the wards and the patients there um which which is fine um and you know you learn to deal with things like post-op complications and you see you know people you get septic quite quickly um whereas on the other hand working as a sho or an f2 in surgery um you get a bit more experience um in theater and you get a bit more opportunity to go to clinics and um when you're on call you team you clerk the new patient so i would probably say um the more useful job would be um, probably as an SHO, just because you get used to clerking and presenting and you have the opportunity to go to theatre and clinics, which um, can really cement whether you want to do surgery or not. Um, but if you can get, you know, it either, either way, both have um, pros and cons, but I would probably say SHO is probably slightly better. Great. Thank you very much, Lucy. I think we'll leave it there. Um, yeah. Thanks everyone who, to everyone who came. Please uh, do give us some feedback uh, so we can improve the webinars for next time. Uh, and for Lucy for her for her portfolio going forwards. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for having me. <laughs>